It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. I am your host, Pastor Jeremy Anderson, uh, along with my co-host, Brother Matthew Marcel. And tonight's episode is going to be an extremely near and dear episode to me. It's going to be special to my heart, simply because not only it's, is it the season finale, our 65th episode of season one, but next week will be four years that Kingdom Productions has been a ministry. And so for the season finale, as well as, I guess, the four-year birthday of the ministry, we decided to have the podcast episode as a video episode, and we're doing it on a topic that I think you all will be very, very interested in. As always, we'll be coming at this topic from a biblical perspective, a biblical point of view, to bring honor and praise to God the Father and Jesus Christ always. But tonight, we have an extremely special guest, Dr. Judd Burton is with us, and we're going to be talking about the topic of vampires, the origin of vampires, and pretty much anything you can think of about vampires that is accurate. I don't know if Dr. Burton will touch on um, any of the mythology that Hollywood likes to portray in the sense of like comparing it to the truth, but for the most part, since Dr. Burton is the expert on this subject, I am simply going to let him handle that part of it. The only thing I may interject is just asking questions, and I know Brother Matthew will probably have some questions, and I'm interested to know um, what Dr. Burton thinks about uh, the vampire from my latest book, and so I'm going to give him a few details about Commander Bane and see what he thinks as far as whether it's accurate or not. But before we turn things over to Dr. Burton. I am going to turn it over to Matthew for just a few minutes and let him say a few things. Brother Matthew, how are you doing tonight, my friend? I'm doing all right, brother. Uh, looking forward to hearing what Brother Brother Judd here uh, has to say. I'm, I'm, uh, for the most part, I'm just going to let him talk because, like you said, he is the expert on the subject, and I'm, I'm very interested to hear the connections that he makes. Um, I know... I know, of course, of course, I know a lot more about uh, the Nephilim than I do vampires, but I know, you know, the the lure, the lore um, on the subject and stuff like that, and of course, what Hollywood portrays on them. Um, I know there is a connection between uh, 
the Nephilim and uh, being, you know, them being the true origin of, of uh, what we call vampires today. But beyond that, I, I don't know much about it, and I'm really excited to to listen and learn um, to see what he, he has to say on it and the connections he makes um, and to see what, you know, what's accurate and what has uh, been uh, added to either mislead or... Um, you know, whatever the whatever the powers that shouldn't be used to uh, mislead and distract people, and you know all the different wiles that they do. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm really interested in in the subject, so I'm gonna turn it over to Brother Judd. Y'all want y'all want to pray with? Absolutely, yeah. I'll open us up in prayer, and then um, I'll turn it over to Brother Judd. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and we thank you so much for this opportunity to come together and discuss these topics that are not only interesting but also important when they are approached from the perspective of your word. Father, I pray that you would just bless this episode tonight and I pray that you would just make sure that everything said here tonight glorifies you, that you would just make sure that we all decrease and you increase and that the Holy Spirit would lead, guide, and direct everything said here tonight. And I pray that just like every episode of this program, that the gospel would be the centralized message that people hear tonight. I ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Judd, how are you tonight? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm actually in a little bit of pain from the fall I took earlier today that I told you about. But other than that, I feel really good. I'm glad to be here. And um, you've always been someone that I've really looked up to and someone that I, I told many people that you are one of the at least top three smartest people that I know of and if I could have my pick of any guest in the Christian world I'd pick you time and time again and that's not me being a respecter of persons that's just I think kind of like a kindred spirit thing you know I've I've watched your videos and followed you for years now and you know I, I have never no matter what it was I've never been um, bored by anything I've read or listened to so I'm extremely blessed and excited to have you on with us tonight well I appreciate that brother I'm just a West Texas kid with alphabet soup after his name uh, I just I fell in love with I had, I had two great loves early on and that was God and books and uh, it seemed like a pretty good pairing, and uh, I, I just I took the Lord's lead after that. So um, I, I'm I'm honored uh, to be on your show, and appreciate uh, all all the following and the uh, keeping up with my research. And where do you guys want to go with this tonight? First, it would help if I would unmute myself <laughs> so people could hear me. But I think that um, we should probably start with. Maybe you could give an introduction to like where the belief in vampires and like what people today believe when they think of a vampire, where that originated from, like say in ancient times and, and not even ancient times, but like medieval times, like the time of Vlad the Impaler, you know, who people call Dracula because of his name and whatnot, but maybe you could kind of tell us the difference between true mythology and the false narrative of mythology. And when I say mythology, I mean like, you know, the, the creatures of the dark, the fallen who can't go into the sunlight and, you know, they have to, they, they're allergic to garlic and they live off of blood, you know, all of the different um, I guess it's what it really is, is the different um, superstitions that people have held throughout the years about vampires and then the truth about them going back to the Nephilim. 
because a lot of people are not going to have any idea unless they've seen, you know, something like the episode you did on French Pop or something like that. They're not going to have any idea where vampires come from or that there's even a hint of vampires in the Bible. You know, when I start talking to people about that aspect of it, they don't believe me until I show them. So maybe you could touch on, you know, the, the history and the origin of vampires going back to the Nephilim. And Matt, you and I will just interject. Okay. Yeah, certainly. That's actually probably a good way to do it is to kind of deconstruct, you know, the, uh, the prevailing ideas in pop culture about vampirism because that's usually where most people intersect with the topic of vampirism. Um, you know, whether it's the, the late, late show or, you know, the latest, um, Netflix production about vampires or, um, for the, the people that still read books, you know, there are plenty of vampire novels out there and a lot of people will be familiar with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, and uh, maybe even even more hardcore literary devotees will be familiar with, with things like John Polidori's The Vampire and uh, maybe a few other other stories about vampires in literature. But the, the that that vampire, the uh, generally speaking suave, not infrequently noble or rich, uh, authoritative uh, kind of a figure. Uh, that that's we're talking about the literary or the cinematic vampire, um, and and really, it's that's not a bad place to start. Uh, it's just that um, the uh, most of it is uh, uh, a kind of um, amalgamation of, uh, of of all all the vampire lore in Europe uh, for the most part. And, um, the, uh, I, I guess you'd say you, you really have to kind of take the, the fangs and the cape away from, um, the, the fangs and the cape away from the vampire, I think, uh, in order to start to, to gain a better understanding of what, uh, the actual historical or folkloric vampire, uh, is. And so that's generally what I encourage people to do, um, is it, to kind of throw out ideas that you've seen on TV or movies about vampires. So, um, it, continuing along with this deconstruction, um, there's uh, uh, probably the, the work that I would point people to um, regarding vampires that helps to really kind of deconstruct pop culture vampire is Montague Summers' uh, The Vampires of Lincoln, which is a monumental opus of a book on the topic of vampires. And um, the, uh, the the scholarly work alone is worth the read because the bibliography in this thing takes up about a sixth of the book. And uh, uh, here's a guy who's who's quite um, erudite when it comes to the classical languages, ancient languages, and the the contemporary Romance languages spoken in Europe. Well, not just Romance languages, but Germanic and Slavic as well. <coughs> pardon, pardon me. I'm I'm getting over a cough from uh, COVID, so I may have to cough from time to time. At any rate, At any rate. the vampire uh, in cinema and pop culture is quite a different thing than it is in actuality uh, in, in real space and time um, in, in history, you might say. And you make the distinction, you know, you wanted me to make the distinction between um, the, the sort of historical veracity that myth has and um, the uh, 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 the sort of misconception, or maybe more accurately, the misuse of the word myth itself that we have in um, Western languages, in particular, but, but languages all around. Usually, when somebody hears the word myth, they immediately associate it with uh, a, a fallacy or a lie or superstition or something like that, something that couldn't possibly be true. But that's not actually, that's really kind of stripping it forcefully away from its etymological roots. The word actually comes from the Greek muthos, which means story. And um, it's not even really a debatable issue anymore that uh, mythology uh, contains at least a nugget of history in most cases. And, uh, you know, we can sit here and, and talk about um, 
you know, the city of Troy in the Homeric literature, which people thought was just an, uh, a, a device that uh, Homer used in, in his epics. But Frank Calvert and Heinrich Schliemann actually found the place uh, in the late 1800s. Um, the Sumerian King's List is another one. Uh, you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh, we were introduced to the King of Uruk, Gilgamesh, whom scholars also thought was, uh, you know, along with a lot of these other uh, uh, ancient uh, god kings, was just a, a creation, a literary creation. But in fact, we find his name on the Sumerian King's List, just as he's described in the literary Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, he was actually the ruler of the city-state of Uruk in ancient Sumeria. So, um, at least that's how he's written down. I have some ideas about about the timing of, of Gilgamesh, but that, that's a, that's an entirely other program. Um, <clears throat> and so, just to sort of set the ground um, and our trajectory is that we we can continually, because of our linguistic inheritance, abuse that word myth uh, so that it's 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 sort of vernacular meaning uh, has outstripped its, its etymology, uh, its, its original connotation of what myth actually meant to the people uh, that recorded this stuff. And so that's sort of the lens through which I'm looking at a lot of the stuff in, in addition to the lens of the Bible. Um, and it was really the aforementioned Montague Summers who introduced me to this concept of, of a tie between uh, the the vampire, which is a perennial feature in the world culture, universe, near universal feature. Um, he's really the first person I ever saw write about this connection between the pre-flood world and the creation of vampires, and he links it to the judgment of the uh, uh, the giants, the Nephilim in the pre-flood world that God gives to Enoch to deliver to the giants. Uh, and of course, it, it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but it, in Enoch, uh, the book of Enoch, he goes, Enoch goes through this, this, all, it reads almost like a judgment, you know, in a, in a legal case. And, um, you know, it, it, it summarizes the destruction that's coming and says that the, that the Nephilim essentially will be destroyed in the flood, both the, the human and the sort of chimeric hybrid Nephilim, uh, and that, um, they would become, uh, unclean spirits on the earth and their appetites, their fleshly appetites would be con constantly raging and they would never be able to satiate them because they were no longer occupying flesh. Um, and uh, uh, it goes on to say that they will placate humanity. And so it stands to reason as, as blethers in the same work, Enoch, and of course this sentiment is echoed in other apocryphal works as well. Um, uh, that are really just an extrapolation from the, the, the first few chapters of Genesis. Um, a kind of, of more detailed commentary into that world. Uh, when we consider just how bloodthirsty and uh, rapacious and awful uh, the pre-flood Nephilim were, uh, you know, we, we're given accounts of, of them, of their behavior and uh, how they consumed the, uh, the, the, resources of humanity and then when those started to run low they began to to, uh, to actually eat the flesh of people and drink their blood uh, and then they turned on each other and, and warred against uh, one another as well and so you know, these are all characteristics that we find universally in vampires all throughout the world um, that they they actually feed off of the life force or, or in most cases the blood and sometimes even the flesh as well of an individual. Um, and the, uh, that's, that's why at the heart of the vampire, uh, at its core, it's a demonic manifestation. Now, there's a kind of manipulation of matter that's taking place because, you know, it, you could, you could look at this as the indwelling of a, a, a person, an actual act of, of possession. Um, or you can look at the manipulation of matter uh, into a form uh, resembling a human or, or a, a, the corpse of a human. Um, this is a, a what's technically a preternatural manifestation uh, of a demon, which of course, again, we're, we're told in Enoch uh, are the, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. The same kind of phraseology, unclean spirit, is used in uh, the New Testament in Greek uh, to describe the demons. 
Um, so there's a definite tie in there. But getting back to the, the core of the vampire, we're definitely looking at a demonic entity who is the heir of not only the behavior and culture of the pre-flood giants, uh, but also the knowledge that their watcher forebears, uh, would have had possession of. And so that would have included the manipulation of matter. So they're able to do that, um, in whatever form they choose to take. And it's not always an anthropomorphic form. That is to say, a, a, a purely human form. In some cases they're chimerical. Uh, in some cases, they're purely uh, theriomorphic. They're not infrequently linked with things like witchcraft and uh, like uh, lycanthropy or werewolfism. Uh, so there can be a, a shape-shifting component to them uh, as well, depending on what culture uh, you happen to be talking about. Now, mo again, most people who, who intersect with this topic via literature or TV or cinema um, usually get a, a, a an amalgamation com conglomerate uh, of the vampire as he exists in Orshi, uh, as they exist within the context of, of European literature and tradition, uh, particularly Eastern European and Slavic and Germanic traditions. Um, but as I pointed out, this is something that this is a kind of creature that we see throughout history and in many of many of the cultures of, of the world. Uh, in fact, you're hard pressed to find a place on the planet that doesn't have some variety of a um, of vampire creature uh, not infrequently linked to uh, the spiritual world um, and if people are interested in actually taking a deeper dive into the breadth of the, the variety of these kinds of creatures in the world uh, the uh, medieval historian Jay Gordon Melton wrote a, a um, a very comprehensive work on vampires, uh, an encyclopedic work, in fact, uh, that covers a lot of these different kinds of vampiric manifestations in different cultures over time and space. Um, and, you know, as a footnote to this, uh, these, these entities that draw on uh, life force or, or blood, the, the universal sacrality of blood is also something that's acknowledged in world culture. Um, you know, if you talk to missionaries that deal with um, you know, they, they, they deal with this kind of stuff on a regular basis. I think people would be shocked, uh, if they talk to more missionaries, particularly that are working in the, the third world, uh, where almost by default people have a kind of a version of the supernatural worldviews. They believe in these kinds of entities. Um, and, and missionaries will tell you stories about all kinds of, of demonic manifestations that they have to deal with. Um, which brings me to another interesting facet. Before I get into uh, looking more at the, the bib, what the Bible has to say in the biblical world beyond beyond the sort of apocryphal uh, Enoch commentary on issues, um, this it brings me to uh, the point of um, that vampires are, are uh, because they're demonic spirits, they're, they're disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Uh, because of that, they're able to. Um, utilize the same kind of, of cultural engineering, linguistic engineering, religious engineering uh, that their watcher forebears uh, took part in in the pre-flood world as well and they would these, these spirits of course and later generations of post-flood giants would do the same kind of thing. What I mean by that and this is true of demonic manifestations of all kinds is that they can both manipulate the culture over time uh to uh, sort of direct on a cultural level how these entities would would be um, uh, uh, manifesting uh, within the, the actual societal and cultural expect expectations of a given culture. Um, the converse, the flip side of that is also true. Um, if uh, when you consider that um, the uh, uh, various kinds of uh, demonic manifestations um, uh, throughout that are recorded really in, in not only not only written history but also oral history attest to the fact that um, that there is a very close relationship between the entities that cultures both fear and revere um, and the manner in which their culture uh, unfolds and so there's this there's this integral link between um, uh, cultures and the, the manner in which 
uh, these these demonic entities, in this case a specific vampiric kind of demonic entity, manifest within a, a given cultural context. So that's something you know to keep in mind. You know whether you're looking at ancient Sumeria or Egypt or India uh, or um, uh, Eastern Europe uh, or the ancient uh, Mesoamerican civilizations, you're going to find culturally specific references. Uh, to to these kinds of manifestations that generally fall fall in line with the kinds of entities that they worship. Um, now, another question is that people generally have, uh, let's just say, Christ, the questions that Christians have is why should why should any of this be important to me beyond its you know its sort of importance within those cultures and the the relevance and value of each culture in, uh, you know in, sort of innately. Um, the answer to that is because the Bible talks about this kind of stuff. Now we already mentioned Enoch, um, so if if we sort of springboard off of that into canonical scripture, um, you know, you don't have to run very far in scripture. You don't even really get out of Genesis before you start dealing with the supernatural view, uh, worldview of ancient Hebrews and the fact that they thought a lot like their neighbors and they believed, you know, in these strange kind of demonic manifestations. Um, the the uh, word that's often used in the Old Testament is the Hebrew ob or familiar spirit. But specifically with regard to vampires, we actually do run into the probably the probably the 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 passage that gets overlooked the most, uh, just beyond the general unclean spirit reference in the New Testament. In the Old Testament there is a reference to um a vampire creature that was well known in the ancient Near East. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, uh, I'm of course talking about, about. Is it the one that a lot of translations translate as screech owl? That's the That's one. That's the one. Uh, 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 yeah. Four is what. We're doing. Um, so yeah, the uh, that verse is is usually translated as um, uh, well. It's a reference to um, <laughs> the words that are generally used are are he goats and uh, the screech owl. Uh, are co basically cavort and ruins out in the wilderness, but so much is lost in the translation there. Um, you, you actually lose the connotation. Like the the uh, the he goats, the actual word there is shedding, and these are are without uh, without debate. These are are satyrs, like the the god Pan in Greek mythology. Um, there are a host of these these uh, goat gods that the ancient Near Eastern peoples worship. Um, and the other one, the one that's usually translated as Screech Owl, uh, is Lilith, uh, Lilith, uh, who's referenced not only in uh, uh, the lore uh, and beliefs of the ancient Levant, but also in ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, she became the uh, the queen of demons and uh, was notorious for um, feeding on infants and children uh, and drinking their blood. So right there... Uh, and of course, there are a couple of other references to, to Lilith too. But you, you start to see that the Old Testament uh, is not bereft of references to uh, 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 vampiric creatures. And, and in fact, um, the cultures surrounding the ancient Hebrews—the Canaanites, the Moabites, the, the Philistines, the uh, the Phoenicians. The Amorites, all of these peoples were, were taking part in blood sacrifice because they believed that their gods demanded this of them. And more often than not, it, it was blood sacrifice of children, of, of innocent, as innocent blood as you can get. Um, and so that's why there are these very strong prohibitions um, in the Mosaic Law, the, the law from the Torah, about uh, the drinking of blood um, because... This was something that had a demonic uh, origin and root to it. Um, you know, the uh, the Levitical reference to the blood is the life. Uh, you know, that that connotes that there's both a physical component and a supernatural component to blood, which of course you know we're learning more and more about as the the months and years roll by. So there's a, a there are clear references to these vampiric kinds of creatures. And undoubtedly, 
this isn't even really up for debate either because um, um, because the ancient Hebrews shared a lot of, of cultural tradition with their neighbors uh, and thought similarly to them in some respects uh, they were not only familiar uh, with this laundry list of, of vampiric entities um, but they believed in them they believed that they were these oh that they reference various authors reference in the Old Testament uh, and so that right there is the is really the, the connective point you didn't see you don't even really have to go beyond canonical scripture to find references to vampires in the Bible uh, and because other places in in the vicinity uh, of the biblical uh, let's say the you know the biblical heartland the Holy Land because there were other places in the biblical world like Egypt like Arabia like Anatolia modern-day Turkey uh, like Persia like Mesopotamia all of these places you know all, all the peoples believed and feared believed in and feared these creatures they were not unknown within the con the larger context of the biblical world <clears throat> well, so I'll, um, I, I was just gonna say that uh, going back to the myths um, you were talking a while ago about the myth um, the mythology of, of the the old mythology of the Greeks and the Romans and the Sumerians you know all the all the different uh, pagan religions are, are just uh, it's basically like you said biblical truths but coming from the fallen angels perspective they're, uh, it's a, a twisting of um, what the bible says because they're trying to mislead and collect the worship for themselves that these sons of God these uh, fallen angels that have these watchers uh, angelic governors that uh, you know God, uh, the bible talks about um, God dividing the nations among the sons of God number of the sons of God these, these uh, fallen angels that the the ancient religions called gods, little g gods, you know, Zeus and Poseidon and, uh, you know, Jupiter, all these different, uh, you know, Ra in Egypt, all these different, these watchers, they're, these myths are just uh, retellings of the biblical churches from a fallen angel perspective and a twisting of it um, to, to deceive and mislead. And um, so, yeah, absolutely, everything that uh, a, a lot of these things are in the Bible. They're just um, there. It's in its true, uh, true form. You know, the true story is in the Bible, and then you can find these nuggets of truth um, in these other uh, things. But they're just, yeah. It's it's a. Uh, I like what you said about the myth. Uh, kind of re-understanding what that word means because um, it's. I think that that. Uh, it kind of leads me to a question too. Um, do you think that? So you were talking about the myths, um, kind of. Uh, well, back when you're talking about the myth and the mythology and, and things like that. So do you think this uh, idea of the vampire, the modern uh, understanding of the vampire, you know, the Hollywood and and uh, books and, and different stuff like that have have painted? Uh, is that just a modern? myth uh for a modern um explanation a modern uh view of something that do you think there's an agenda behind i guess what i'm saying um in the uh the lure in the 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 lore in the um mythology of the modern vampire you know the the ones that you see in the in the hollywood uh do you think there's an i mean i guess it's an obvious answer is yes but what do you think might be the angle of um, why they're trying they're they're taking this something that is true that is true entities uh, but they're kind of repainting it remasquerading it into something which I guess it's not even a new thing uh, from what you're saying I guess but it does it does that make sense that question kind of makes sense like what um, do you, what do you think that they're, they're trying to do with these different Ideas. Yes, I think so. Um, I, I think that there's a definite agenda behind generally the pop culture version of the vampire that you find, especially today. And, and I would say in recent decades, um, you know, the vampire is presented as a kind of uh, almost hero, you know, in modern uh, modern uh, pop culture and cinema, that sort of thing. Whereas once, you know, he was rightly decried as as a villain. 
Um, and there's a there's a danger in that in making making something as insidious as a vampire, which is demonic, look like a a paragon to people. Uh, look like something to, to be aspired to. Uh, so that yeah, that's a very uh, nefarious agenda, I would say. And um, you know, in, in in literature, you sort of see that that arc. Um, but like even in uh, like for the most famous vampire novel, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Stoker presented, uh, interestingly enough, presented faith in Christ as a, a central weapon that the vampire hunters were using against Dracula. Uh, and then you fast forward into uh, the modern era, you start getting people looking at different versions of the vampire, like uh, Richard Matheson's uh, I Am Legend, uh, which looked at a sort of... Uh, uh, the beginnings of the postmodern vampire, the sort of a religious vampire who was brought about by a pathogen. Uh, and then you had Anne Rice, who, who, interestingly enough, towed the line. I wouldn't say that she necessarily, necessarily went over the line and made the vampires heroes, per se. They were definitely anti-heroes. Um, but even with, with Anne Rice's vampires, you know, characters like Louis and Lestat and Armand, even though they, on on the one hand, they sort of relish in their abilities and what they call the dark gift, there's also this recurring theme amongst all of them as a kind of self-loathing. Like, they knew what they were doing was monstrous and unnatural. Uh, so there, there's that element that sort of separates those kinds of vampires, those literary vampires from, uh, or pop culture vampires too, from the ones in more recent years and recent decades uh, in, in programs like uh, the Vampire Diaries and uh, movies like the, the very popular Twilight series, um, where you know vampires are are sexy and suave and uh, something to be aspired to, uh, and that brings well, me even, to the under the under. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add real quick. Uh, even that aspect of uh, the romanticizing over things. I, I mean, you see that. Not just with vampires, especially with vampires, especially uh, modern day, uh, with um, you know trying to uh, encourage the um, you know the the sexual aspect of trying to to kind of woo like teenage girls and women into uh, these abominational uh, relationships with monsters and and nephilim. Really, I mean, and even you see the same kind of ideas with. Um, you know, like chimera creatures and, and modern sci-fi movies and, and even, uh, like decades previous as well. But, and then angels, you have movies about, uh, you know, relate, um, relationships with, uh, angels and, um, you know, women. And I mean, it's the same kind of narrative, just, uh, making it more normalized. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. That's, and that's, that's the thing like you say there are other elements there are other kinds of, of creatures that are also made to be the hero or something to be aspired to that are clearly demonic you know looking at it from a biblical perspective um, and that's you see so much of that now in, in pop culture but it's you can go back you know a number of years and decades and start to see where that you know that that's that's begun to really change um, and that's that's probably a good good point to segue into the fact that whether we're talking about the agenda to uh you know make the, the vampire more appealing uh or we're looking at the, the sort of mythological folkloric and historical groundings for the vampire um what just like any other aspect of the demonic realm what is it that they offer well they they corrupt everything and they turn it on its head they take what god creates they corrupt it they take, they make facsimiles of what God offers. Christ offers eternal life through the shedding of His blood. He gives His, He gives His blood. The vampire offers a false, counterfeit eternity because He takes blood, He takes life force, He takes energy. Uh, and so, really, at the end of the day, what you have is is the vampire is this like like many things demonic, uh, if not all of them are this, in some way, shape, or form, are this terrible parody of Jesus Christ. They're a terrible parody of what God offers, of what God's good and just and loving and compassionate and patient plan is. Um, you, you find that the vampire, along with, it, along with its demonic colleagues, 
uh, is that that counterfeit version uh, of the good, and it's something that recurs again and again and again because this, as I pointed out at the beginning of the program, the vampire is, is archetypal. It's universal, uh, not just archetypal. It's something that's found in real space and time, um, uh, uh, because of the mountains and mountains of evidence from um, uh, oral history and mythology and. Uh, even folklore and history because to some degree or another all, all of these axes of research uh, depend heavily on uh, uh, the experiences of people with the supernatural you know they they, they represent accounts of, of things that people believe happen in real space and time and it only takes a certain percentage of those to actually have happened for, in this case, the vampire to be a supernatural and material reality. And I think that there's more, when you, when you look at mythology and folklore uh, through the sort of anthropological lens and the biblical lens, like I've been doing over the last decade or more, you know, combining those approaches, then you really, you have a hard time coming up with any other conclusion at the end of the day, uh, is that, you know, there, there is a, a, a supernatural reality and it, of course, other, many other people, you know, in this space uh, have written about it, um, and uh, both in, in fiction and in nonfiction. Uh, so we're all sort of, of offering different approaches and insights on the same, you know, supernatural reality that we see really uh, unfolding us uh, unfolding in front of us in real space and time. Um, and it's, it's a real danger for the church today not to not to have some conversancy in these topics, not just to be able to talk to younger people because of, of the pop culture and, and sort of, you know, agenda driven, uh, cultural engineering that's taking place. Uh, but also because this is definitely something that intersects with the biblical narrative, with the biblical conversation. And that immediately makes it pertinent and relevant to, uh, the church. And so, you know, I'm not saying that the people, have to, or people in the church have to become experts on these kinds of, of rather arcane and peripheral topics. Um, but I, I think once they do uh, begin to to dig into it and look at it from a supernatural biblical perspective, they'll start to see that these issues aren't necessarily so peripheral or marginal, that they're actually central because they're tied in with the demonic. And, you know, if, if Christ is our exemplar, easily half of Jesus's ministry was dealing with people who were oppressed or possessed or demonized in some way by these kinds of entities, by demonic entities in general. Uh, and undoubtedly, which would have undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly had uh, involved uh, this vampiric uh, unclean spirit that we're talking about. So um, I, I also believe that because we're, we're, you know, call it whatever you want to, we're living in Jacob's tr- trouble or, or whatever, I'm not a date setter, but it's very clear that, that the prophetic clock is ticking. And, you know, these are the kinds of, of, of things that we can expect in, in more, uh, we can expect to occur with greater frequency as the years go on. And in fact, I think, I think with the abundance and preponderance of, of, of all kinds of cryptid sightings, you know, dogmen and skinwalkers and shapeshifters of all kind, um, these kinds of, of reports are coming in with greater frequency. And I think it's really just a sign of the times. Um, and so that, again, that's something that makes it immediately relevant to the church because if our mission is to make disciples, uh, of people in the world, there's a, there, there's that, that sort of missiological, uh, missionary value to knowing something, uh, about this sort of thing. And again, I would encourage people to talk to missionaries because they, they have to deal with this stuff all the time. Um, but uh, it, it, a lot of this stuff is, is coming home to roost, if you will. Yeah, I uh, agree completely. We are certainly getting closer and closer and deeper and deeper into the end time. And that's why um, I felt that it was important to write the, the book series that I started with the first book I just put out in the series. And, you know, there are many books on the end times, you know, left behind um, the Chronicles of the Apocalypse. There are so many by authors that I don't know their names that 
it's ridiculous. Um, I was doing a search a while back on Amazon, and there there really is hundreds. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone that I either read or just read the introduction and reviews, they're pretty much all from a perspective that I see is unbiblical, you know, um, and I'm not, tonight's program is not any way, shape, or form about eschatology, and I don't want to get into anybody's belief on eschatology. I just brought it up to point out that the, the reason I wrote the book wasn't because I thought I could somehow write a better fictional novel or series than these guys because, you know, I'm the first to admit that I'm no Tim LaHaye and I'm no Brian Gadawa, you know, and I probably never will be. My uh, goal was to write a book series starting with the first book that was first and foremost theologically and biblically sound and then was also entertaining but the entertaining part being secondary and you know I'm sure it won't sell near as many books as you know some of these big name books that have been out for years that are published by huge publishers but you know yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but you know something somebody will somebody pick, will pick that book up and read and it, read it. What, yeah, what, yeah. whereas, whereas they, they think Read something, read something like, like Bible. Bible. Read, read book, book. And, and talking about talking about something. In the, in that, that, that's that's somebody, 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 somebody book, book, and that'll be and that'll be that 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 may be that may be their introduction. To, so yeah, so, yeah. There's, yeah, there's, there's, a, lot there's of, a lot. You 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 reference, you reference uh, 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 both both out, 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 out they understand, they understand that. that. They un people, people, people spend, spend judgment, judgment there, there, and, and it, it, it's brained brain brain and brain and brain so. Any, anyway, um, yeah, if, yeah, uh, if, uh, I wasn't able to, I, I couldn't hear the last thing you said, and I didn't know if you were, um, finished talking. I didn't want to interrupt you. No, I, no, I, 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 I was, um, I wanted, since we were talking about, well, you started off talking about, you know, the ancient literature from, you know, ancient Sumeria and Mesopotamia and um, like the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Sumerian Kings list, but you also were um, talking about the Book of Enoch, you know, extra mm -hmm. biblical writings that I believe are, you know, regardless to what people think about who the author of the book was, to me, the fact that, you know, the Bible validates it in the New Testament and the Old Testament, um, you know, the, the narrative in Genesis and Deuteronomy 32, Psalms 82, all of that, you know, comes, it's the same narrative pretty much that's found in the book of Enoch. So I think it's definitely an important book that you can gain a lot of knowledge. And I think there's even a blessing that can be had from, from reading it because it's very clearly a book for those living in the end time and it, it, it also has more references to Christ and you know even prophecies about uh, the Son of Man than any other you know book outside of the Bible itself and regardless to what anybody thinks about whether it should or shouldn't be scripture you know, that is beside the point point is the narrative in the book begins of course with the book of the watchers and the characters the bad guys in dominion of darkness uh book one first book Darion rising pretty much all of them come from the book Phenop, the bible and the book of jasher but the only there's really nothing from the book of jasher that you're going to find in the book that isn't found in the book of Enoch. You know, I just say the book of Jasher because some of the stuff, you know, is found in the book, but I I never once, you know, picked up the book or referenced it when I was writing. However, um, you know, the 
in the prologue, in the introduction of the book, um, it actually, I, I quote from the Book of Enoch, and, you know, I, I, so, I show um, Simjaz and the 200 coming down on Mount Hermon, but then I pose the question, you know, uh, Simjaza is very aware of the consequences of the actions he's about to take, you know, that's the whole reason for the oath, mm -hmm. so that he is he alone isn't the only one to have to bear the burden of the great sin that they're about to commit. So I ask the question, um, who is subtle and wise like a serpent enough to cause someone like the leader of the Watcher to rebel against the Most High and fall? Because, and I've heard this from many different points of view. Um, I've heard Dr. Michael Heiser talk about this a lot on his Naked Bible podcast and in videos. You know, the fact that maybe, uh, you know, there's the Book of Enoch only shows us in the beginning, you know, how the Watchers came down onto the summit of Mount Hermon. But if we look at the Divine Council narrative, you know, how they were supposed to direct worship to the Most High, there is nothing that I can find that says for certain that the want that the Watchers first time on Earth was when they landed on Mount Hermon. Uh, you know, they, they definitely were with the Almighty long before that. Um, you know, I don't know how long, but I don't want to get off topic. What I'm saying is, in the book, I don't come right out and say it, although I do, um, I do hint at it and pretty much show it to be the, the narrative that I, I'm writing and the way that I'm going, and that is that they were following the lead of the Satan character, you know, the, the serpent in the garden, um, whatever you want to call him, whether you want to call him Hellel or Samael or uh, Gadriel, you know, some people think that his name was Gadriel because of the Book of Enoch. Um, regardless of what you want to call him, you know, in the book I, I give pretty much every name that he, he's ever gone by and I really have him being the one who put the watchers up to what they did. Now, whether that is how it happened or not, I don't, there's no way I can know that for sure. But I do know that after this happens, you know, the Nephilim are considered the seed of the serpent. You know, these are the people who are um, against the seed of the woman in the sense of, you know, you got Israel versus these um, surrounding nations, all of the nations that have the giants, the post-flood Nephilim. But in any case, the characters in the book are, of course, Lucifer, and he's not called Lucifer in the book until, you know, like, towards our, closer to our time because of you know, the way the, the Latin transfer, I mean, uh, translates the word. And so people from that point on in real life have called him Lucifer. But in any, in any respect, he is the leader of all of the quote unquote gods who are the fallen angels in the book. And it is a fiction book, but it's based on fact. We know from scripture that the God of this world, according to Jesus himself, is Satan. He is the God of this world. And, you know, John tells us that the whole world is, lies under the power of the evil. So all of these different principalities that are behind the kings, whether it be in ancient history or in modern times, they all answer to the dragon. And so in the book, the narrative is once we get to modern time, you have only a few watchers from the original 200 who were not bound in Tartar. I don't go into how they escaped it, 
because I didn't want to speculate too much. You know, there's no way to write a fictional book like that without speculating some, but I didn't want to speculate on too many things. But and then there's one original Nephilim who is the son of the Watcher Armoros, which in the book, Armoros ends up being the god of magic and the sea, who, you know, in, in Egypt, he was Heka, and, you know, he was known as Poseidon, and Neptune, and uh, all of these other names for the same entity. Now, I'm not saying that that's really who ended up being this entity, but in the book, for the purpose of the book, the Watcher Armoros from the Book of Enoch was one that was not found in Tartarus, and his son, Bane, was one of the original Nephilim, and because his father was uh, the god of magic and the sea, he was able to escape the flood, and his son was able to escape the flood because he inherited the traits from his father. Well, there's nothing in any of the biblical literature or extra biblical literature that says that a Nephilim can live for 6,000 years, but there's nothing that says that if they wouldn't have, you know, if God would not have caused them to war against each other and then sent the flood, there's nothing that says that they couldn't have lived that long either. So for the sake of <laughs> um, just taking a little bit of, a little bit of fictional, whatever you want to call it, um, I made him to be one of the original Nephilim, he's 6,000 years old, and he's also a vampire. Now, in the book, he does drink blood, but he doesn't have to, it's not like he survives. You know, he, drink, he drinks blood because he's evil, um, and his father ends up being the admiral of the entire United States Navy, and he ends up being the commander of an elite unit of the Navy. It happens to be a, a real covert branch of the Navy called Red Cell, and in real life, nobody really knows what they do. So uh, I thought it fit the narrative really well to have them as this covert branch of the military that was run at the very top by Satan and that because they were in the end times, you know, they're all of their goal, they are the ones who are responsible for starting World War Three and they are stabilizing governments and currencies and pretty much everything that we actually see going on today and more. Um, there's even the story, like, I know most people have heard of the Kandahar giant, you know, the, the Nephilim giant, um, that L.A. Marzulli had the, uh, one of the guys who, uh, came in contact with this, this giant in the interview that he did with him, but in the book, one of the characters, the good characters, um, was a part of that team who actually were hunting these giants in Afghanistan and he thought they were hunting them to kill them but then you know when when they finally come in contact with them it's not one it's two they aren't hunting them to kill them but the CIA is recruiting them for this they're they're capturing them and recruiting them for this this covert branch of the military but I wanted to ask um just as far as the the character Bane is concerned. He is um, like I've got I've got the book in front of me uh, pulled up on Kindle, and um, I, I'm not gonna read a lot, but I am just gonna give some of his characteristics from the the chapter that focuses entirely on him. And he's in a bar. Um, he's in Coronado. Coronado, California, um, you know, where the, the Navy SEALs are, and he's there well, because he's recruiting uh, one of the main characters who is a Navy SEAL. But he's in a bar, which is one of his, you know, one of his hangouts, and 
He, um, he says, I'm just going to start here. Bane decided that he needed another drink. This was his fourth or fifth of the day, but it wasn't the only type of drink he was craving. He usually came in to find a beautiful woman and tap her jugular. It would have to do for now, though, because today he was working and he could not afford to tick his uncle off. Bartender, I'll take another. Make this one a double. Okay, I'm going to skip down some just to kind of describe it. The bartender is very frightened by the way he looks. And so he's stuttering when he's talking to him. And it says here, it says, Bane pulled a lot of long, dark hair away from his face. He reached inside his black trench coat, and the bartender took a nervous step back. Bane ignored making eye contact with the man as he brought out several hundred dollar bills from his wallet, dropped them on the counter, and said, forget the double shot, I'll just take the bottle. And... Okay, here we go. Bane was an extremely intimidating figure at eight foot tall with long dark hair and golden eyes. The bartender was used to seeing strange looking individuals, so he didn't pay much attention to Bane's appearance. This was California after all. There were many legends and myths about creatures like Bane, and in modern times, the world no longer believed supernatural beings existed. If this was a novel or a movie, Bane would be called a vampire a creature of the night who couldn't survive in the sunlight, but the truth of his existence was much more frightening than the vampires of fictional novels and Hollywood movies. Bane was a fallen Nephilim born from the mating of fallen watcher with human woman. Sure, you could consider Bane a vampire, as all vampire myths and lore originated from the Nephilim, but Bane was almost 6,000 years old and one of the few, if not the only, Nephilim who survived the flood, sent as the wrath of the Creator and Most High God. Bane would not have been able to survive if his father wasn't the God of the sea. Many nations knew and worshipped his father under different names. He was both Heka and Nun to the Egyptians. He was Poseidon to the Greeks and Neptune to the Rome. Bane's father, however, was no more a god than any other quote-unquote god of the ancient world. He was one of the fallen angels that the ancients worshipped as god. But he was able to live and breathe underwater, and he passed that ability on to some of his offspring, which is how Bane survived the flood. Bane missed the old days when he was treated with the fear and respect someone as powerful as he deserved. The Dark Ages were glorious in his opinion. He owned the knights and lived in cats. He slaughtered people by the hundreds and reveled in the carnage. I'll stop there. I just wanted to give a description of the vampire from the book and show mm -hmm. that he's not the vampire of most fictional novels. Now, before I became a believer, <laughs> vampire novels were my favorite kind. Um, my favorite books of all time before I got saved were the House of Night series by PC and Kristen Cat. And because of those books, and I read all of them, I and mean, I couldn't wait for the next one to come out, but because of those books, and there was a fallen angel in the book um, named Kelowna, and all vampires, I mean, these books, I didn't realize it until I became a believer, but these books literally have a ton of truth in them but they also like matthew were talk was talking about earlier only give small amounts of truth because although there's this fallen angel who creates the vampires quote unquote nephilim <laughs> and his son in the book is named Rephaim. i mean you can't get more any more um blatant than that but the god the actual god in this book is not the god of the bible but a goddess and i found after reading the books because i started researching a lot of native american history and lore that a lot of what's in the books come from native american lore because the native americans believed in vampires um and there's a lot of Native American oral tradition that 
is a lot like the Bible, including giants and the flood. But for time's sake, I'm going to stop talking and turn it back over to you and get your opinion on Bane as far as um, an accurate portrayal of a true vampire. Not necessarily today, but, you know, because I, I, I'm aware that it's very unlikely that even the original Nephilim would have been able to live 6,000 years. But, in any case, just an accurate portrayal of an original Nephilim and an actual vampire. I know that most of them today would be the spirits of the Nephilim, but I just wanted to get your opinion there. Certainly. Certainly. Well, I, well, think, I, I think, think it, 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 a, character a character who, who you know, fits you know, the physical model we're working on, uh, or we're talking about whether this evening, um, you know, you, you tie him to his proper demonic, you know, Nephilim pre-flood origins, uh, some really inter- interesting innovations in how he survived the flood, uh, you know, there's a there's a legend in Jewish folklore about Og surviving the flood, well, now whether that, that actually happened or not is, is difficult to determine for a fact. Um, but the mechanism by which you have your character surviving the flood is really interesting. That ability to breathe underwater. Um, but as I said, that you know that book may be the the touchstone, the spark that gets somebody to think about these subjects, whether they're Christian or not, uh, along the lines of, um, of you know the biblical perspective, the biblical worldview, uh, and, and specifically the divine counsel worldview of the Bible. Um, you know that's why I. I've actually got a, a forthcoming book that deals not just with the vampires, but werewolves and zombies and revenants and all kinds of, of these demonic manifestations and folklore and their pre-flood uh, origins. It's called the, it'll be called the Van Helsing Way, uh, and is forthcoming. And I also also teach coursework on this. My preternatural morphology program uh, through the Institute of Biblical Anthropology. Uh, is available and people can email me at Professor Burton at yahoo.com if they're interested. Uh, about to launch the new, the new platform for that and people can check that out at drjudburton.com, D-R-J-U-D-B-U-R-T-O-N.com and the original tioba.org, uh, domain website address for the institute itself, uh, will be uh, up and running within the next week or so, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I would just circle back to the fact that you know this is this is timely and pertinent material, and it's something that the church needs to be, you know, in, in some capacity studying. And you know, with books like yours, and you know, you make reference Brian Kadawa, people that are putting this into a fictional context uh, and, and basing it on a biblical worldview, I think, are, are honest something because, like I said, there's something that happens in your brain where you suspend judgment, you know, about what you're reading if it's fiction. Uh, and there are these, you know, nuggets, you know, there's a biblical foundation for this fictional narrative, uh, that you're writing. And I think that's a valuable ministerial tool. So kudos, um, my hats off to you for, for doing this. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to take my leave, um, here in just a minute. So I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to, uh, wind it down myself because, um, I, didn't bring a charger with me and the thing just recommended that I turn battery saver on so um, for sake of it not I guess cutting off we're going to have to uh, close it down and wind it up but I appreciate you coming on so much brother and I I hope that next year when we um start season two which we'll be starting season two in january but i hope sometime next year that you'll be able to come back on and we can talk about something else or you know who knows where the lord's going to lead but i do know that i believe wholeheartedly that the lord is leading us to start having guests on again like when i did the remnant report which was pretty much entirely video um although i did put the audio up on the podcast um you know, I, that's 
pretty much all I did was have guests on. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, this program has been focused more on Bible study and getting back to the, it says name says, um, the historic faith, you know, return of the historic faith. You know, we, most of the topics we cover are things that the, anti, the anti-Nicene writers believed and wrote about. And right, you know, right. we, uh, most of the episodes are dealing with the anti-Nicene writing, but uh, we're not going to steer away from that next season, but we are going to have more guests on. And I hope wholeheartedly that we can have you back on because I truly enjoyed it. I could, I could listen to you talk about this stuff all night. I'm telling you, you and Gary Wayne, <laughs> I can listen to all night long. And I have uh, not... That'll work, man. That's that is my favorite subject of all um, outside of the Bible. But you know that is biblical because what one of the things I love about it most is you can pretty much reconstruct the entire New Testament just from Mm -hmm. their right, which proves that they had the New Testament, (laughs) Um, or at least the the teachings from the New Testament. But um, I enjoyed having you on, and I enjoyed Brother Matthew being back with us again. It's been quite a while since Brother Matthew's been on his uh, job and um, things going on personally that, I mean, not aren't bad things, but things with his, his child. Um, you know, they've, they've had to do a lot of things with, with their son that kept him from being able to, to come on and co-host with me every episode and so I really enjoyed having him back on and we both I know enjoyed having you on and we're gonna close it out now and Brother Matt you got anything to say before we close the episode out? I, I just wanted to to tell you thank you for uh, coming on and we absolutely need to have you back um, I, I didn't catch what you said what you uh, what y'all wanted to talk about next time it cut out for a second the anti nicene writing the early church. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, that's that. That's a great topic. <laughs> like Jeremy said, we we uh, we we tend to focus on um, on that a lot. So I think that's a great that's a great because uh, they they put such an emphasis on um, part of following Jesus is following what he said. I mean, that's you know we can't we can't follow Jesus without following what he said. And um, the 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 uh, earliest Christians uh, pre-Constantine before Constantine first 300 years that's they took what Jesus said very literally and they followed what he said um, because they loved they loved him I mean they they didn't do it out of uh, a checklist of laws they they obeyed him lit and took him very seriously because they loved him and um, out of faithfulness to him and, and that's um, also uh you know we're not an except just because we live in a modern day that uh pretty much blows off everything jesus says and we live in this hyper grace uh this hyper grace culture we could basically just be christian in name but live however we want to live and think that jesus is going to be okay with that uh you know it don't matter what we what we uh we how we uh or the preacher or the or parents or how anybody else says jesus says no matter what, what we say he said you know what he really meant uh jesus said what he said and he meant what he said and we're we're to be uh following that um because out of love for him abiding uh abiding in him out of love for him um if you love me keep me keep my so so <laughs> Well, I'm gonna put your um, I'm gonna put your your details for where people can find you in the uh, description of the program. Do you want to you want to plug your plug your website uh, uh, and, and YouTube channel? Yeah, and yeah, your channel. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 again, people can, people can see, see my, my Dr. Judd Burton on YouTube. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Um, People can, uh, like I said, I, I'm, I'm teaching classes, and people can uh, uh, see the new launch here, probably within a, a few days, if not next week. Um, 
at uh, drjudburton.com, D-R-J-U-D-D-B-U-R-T-O-N.com, and the original TIOBA.org website for the Institute. That, that address will be working soon as well. Um, I have a forthcoming book, uh, The Van Helsing Way. Uh, on, uh, on topics related to work. Can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. But I, that's all, that's I, all. I definitely will. Um, I'll put all of the links to where people can find your YouTube channel and website and the things that you want in the description. I'll get from you and I'll have them all linked so people can just click on them and go directly to you. But we want to thank each and every one of you for watching. For those of you listening to the podcast, thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm Pastor Jeremy Anderson, a.k.a. The Remnant Warrior, for Return of the Historic Faith and Kingdom Productions, saying until next time, God bless each and every one of you. Good night, grace, and peace.